uh, it'll help connect the answers with our panelists. I will go ahead and say hello right now. And Judy, go ahead and take down that screen share. I'll appreciate it. And then Hector, let me spotlight your camera. All right, Hector, I'm gonna go ahead and start the recording. So in a few seconds, as usual, go ahead and take it away. All right, hey, welcome everybody. My name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions for Academy of Art University here in San Francisco, California, USA. I see that we have a lot of people on the event tonight. We wanted to welcome you. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us, spending your morning with us, whatever it may be. Hey, Amari, thank you for the shout out out there. So, uh, hey, please do me a favor while we're waiting for people to uh, join in. Please let us know where you're from in the chat. Uh, as a reminder, if you haven't already, hey, Peter, what's up, buddy? When you look in the, uh, at the bottom of your screen right below here, make sure when you click on the chat button that you're also adjusting it to all panelists and attendees. So uh, howdy out there in Texas, Brazil. We have Indiana in the house tonight, Vallejo, New York, Miami, Vacaville, Princeton. We have Kelsey in Chicago. We have Korea in the house, Anyaseo. We have South Carolina, Alaska, Tampa, Kentucky. Hello, everybody out there. Hey, Megan in Brooklyn is here tonight. Taiwan, good to see you all. All right. Hi from San Diego, Hannah. Hey. That's where I'm from, San Diego too. So there you go, Bay Area. All right, so lots of cool uh, Costa Rica, hola. So lots of people all over the place. I mean, there's about 150 of you out there right now and still climbing for the event. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, obviously we're trying to do everything we can to make fun events, keep people engaged. We wanna make sure that we're doing exciting things for our students out there. So we brought two of our best tonight to try to help teach you something really cool. So before we get started on that, let me take the time to drop a couple of links for our upcoming events. So if you can do me a favor, hold off in the chat. As always, every Tuesday, we do events at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This next Tuesday will be an event on perspective drawing using Photoshop. So anybody out there that's interested in learning some cool tips and tricks with Photoshop and how to draw perspective digitally, make sure that you RSVP and join us for that. That's Tuesday, August 4th at 7 p.m. The next event after that will be the following Thursday, uh, which is August 6th. So anybody out there that's looking at becoming an online student, I would highly encourage you, even if this is your first time being an online student, even if you've taken online courses before, I guarantee you the way that we operate online is very unique and different. So this is a workshop to show students how to become an online student, what type of feedback we provide, what it looks like in those classrooms, how teachers interact with students. So please, if you can, that'll be at 5 p.m. Thursday, August 6th. You can RSVP at that link too. I'll be hosting that as well with Reed Rocker, our Senior Director of Admissions. That's always super helpful for students, especially if they're thinking about joining us as soon as this fall. So without further ado, what we came here today is to basically teach you all about how to create an animated logo. So like I said, we have two of our best here today to take, uh, take the reins here and show you how to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce here uh, first, I want to introduce our online director, Nikki Kippel. Uh, Nikki is an interactive designer from San Francisco, and she is a 2010 BFA graduate from the School of Web Design and New Media. Her work experience ranges from motion graphics to designing interactive experiences and managing teams of designers for companies big and small. So Nikki's worked for companies including Amazon, Gallo, Indeed, Chegg, Southbees, Autodesk, and Tapjoy. She now devotes her time to education, online education standards, and curriculum. She's very passionate about mentoring students and supporting them to achieve their goals. We also have Andrea Pimentel. Andrea is our co-director for both the Advertising School and the School of Web Design and New Media. So a little bit about Andrea. She's an award-winning interactive art director, creative director, and a UI designer. She's worked for large-scale websites, startups, mobile apps, and some of San Francisco's top advertising agencies developing cutting edge campaigns. So in her roles as art director and creative director, Andrea has worked with so many different top brands. Uh, to name a few, she's worked with Suzuki, Shutterfly, G4 TV, Sandisk, Nokia, uh, Tonkin Health, Wamu, eBay, Bank of America, and there's others out there as well. So Andrea's also taught classes 
uh, but she's also had leadership roles in the School of the Web and Des Web Design and New Media Department, as well as advertisement. So without further ado, this will be the plan for tonight. I'll be your host, but I'm going to be hiding in the chat over here. My role is just to engage with you, ask questions, make sure that we get to everything. A couple tips I would give you for these workshops, though. Have fun, ask questions, engage. We will not be able to hear you, so make sure that you're following along in the chat. I'll do my best to answer as many questions as possible and to continue to push the conversation. So if you have any pressing questions that we don't get to, we will always hang back at the end and have some Q&A and some dialogue as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Andrea, the star of our show tonight, and you'll see me in the chat and I'll see you guys at the end of the event, okay? Have a good one, guys. I'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Hector. We really appreciate the introduction. We're really excited to be here with you. And Nikki and I are both really excited to join you. Um, this is part of what we do every day is we teach classes um, this way um, uh, as well as other ways. So this is exciting for us to be able to do it for kind of a bigger group and um, kind of show you just some kind of fun stuff. We chose this animated logo to do tonight because because it's fun <laughs> and it's something that really, you know, represents, you know, what we do in our departments. So we represent the advertising department and the web design and new media department uh, where we really care about brands. So we use logos a lot. We really care about technology and software. We like to make things move. We might like to make things showy. We like to have fun. We're like we're really fun departments. We really like to uh, just kind of um, you know, make everything <laughs> move a little bit, have it uh, go a little crazy with it. So what we're going to do tonight is um, I'm going to take you kind of step by step through designing the logo. Um, and then Nikki will show you how to animate that logo. So hopefully um, you'll get some skills by the end. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to try. Uh, we will be going a little fast and skipping, you know, some of the repetitive steps a little bit, um, but you're welcome to try and create your own version. We'd love to see what it is that you create uh, if you do. Um, so uh, we're also happy to talk about the advertising department and the web design and media department, but I think we can just get into talking about logos. Logos are really fun to design, but they're also surprisingly hard. <laughs> there, that, there's something that looks, all the best logos look so simple and that's what makes them hard. Every single thing has to be perfect, and it's hard to get your idea down to something so, so simple. So many professional logos take months to, to finish. We're going to do one in a little over an hour tonight, so it might not be perfect, but we're going to uh, at least try to make it fun. Um, but remember that creating a logo is really hard, and it's about kind of making the most simple thing that you can a lot of the time. We're going to break that rule a little bit tonight by doing kind of a little bit of an over-the-top uh, logo uh, that will be a little bit crazy. Um, all right, so... Um, I, let's see, so our fake company that we're making a logo for is called Gelato Agogo. So if you like gelato, if you like ice cream, this logo is for you. Um, the Agogo part, if you are younger than I am, um, that, you know, it's like, it calls back to disco, that's kind of 70s, uh, kind of fun nightclub kind of vibe. So we're going to kind of like lean into that a little bit. And our concept is going to kind of be a little bit 70s, a little bit disco, but also kind of keeping the gelato ice cream sweet treat kind of fun to it. So when I create a logo, one of the things that I like to start out with is I like to start out with kind of just thinking about some of the things um, that might inspire it and collecting some images, collecting some colors, collecting some fonts. So I'm going to start sharing my screen right now and share kind of my mood board for this logo. It's not really a mood board. It's more just a collection of stuff. So hopefully you can see my collection of crazy stuff here. I told you we were doing an over the top logo today. And so we got over the top for sure um, in this. Um, am I sharing the right screen? Do you see this mood board? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So as you can see, the stuff I've collected here are really, really colorful. Um, lots of color. I can't. I, I'm having trouble with my mouse selecting the right thing. Hold on. 
Um, I'm trying to make it so we can see this whole thing. There we go. Um, all right, so you can see that I pulled inspiration from a, a few different areas. One of the things that I like to do is kind of make a list of words that inspire me or help me kind of focus my design direction um, a little bit. So, you know, I didn't put Italian on here, but that usually comes with gelato as that's kind of more specifically Italian. Um, like I, you see, I didn't put the word ice cream in here. Um, literally what something does is usually not super important to a logo. We're gonna add it in here um, in this concept this time, but uh, usually we want our logo to communicate a feeling um, about that brand more than about what they literally do. Uh, we kind of go into uh, abstraction versus literal. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but we're trying to communicate a feeling about this brand. Is this brand cool? Is this brand traditional? Is this brand expensive? Those are the kinds of things we want to answer with our, our logo and communicate with people. They'll know through advertising and stuff what we sell. We want to be able to kind of communicate some of the values and feelings. So some of the words that I put here were over the top. We want to go crazy with this logo and make it just kind of nuts. We talked about how a go-go really is disco. And so we want to kind of have that disco vibe to it, that kind of 70s feeling to it. We want it to be fun. We want it to be funky. I liked the word electric here when I was looking at my... Um, you know, looking for inspiration images, I saw a lot of like neon signs. I saw a lot of these electric colors. Um, and so that's a word that kind of jumped out to me as a real design inspiration I could pull from. And then you see here, there's a lot of kind of geometry that happens from that kind of 70s stuff that we pulled up here. You know, if you notice here, like a lot of these words, these letters are kind of geometric shapes where they've kind of boiled it down to just the geometric shape. So that's really inspirational for what I can do here. I love like this Italian poster where they've made every letter like almost a circle. Like that's kind of fun. Um, I love kind of the, the, the offset lines here, kind of the, the, the kind of radiating colors around that we see a lot kind of from design of this era. So I pulled some colors from this. I pulled some inspiration from that. So I think um, I'm ready to kind of do my concept. So here's kind of my concept. It's a crappy drawing, but it's okay. Normally it's just for me. Today I have to share my crappy drawing with all of you. Um, when I was in art school, I was really nervous about having to show people my drawing skills because that's not my biggest skill. Um, so if you're a little nervous about your drawing skills, know that in our majors, like usually your drawing is just for you, just for you to kind of come up with your idea. It's not that you have to show a drawing. That was something that made me nervous about art school and it was something I didn't need to be nervous about uh, in our areas. So if that's something you're nervous about, <laughs> join the club. So anyway, here's my, um, here's my logo concept. And of course, you know, I'm going to really have to look for a really good font for this. And so my lettering doesn't look pretty good. It was just kind of to communicate an idea uh, with myself. Uh, so, you know, I really kind of, really kind of wanted to lean into the fact that the word gelato and a go-go -go have a lot of letters that are round in it. There's a lot of O's, um, there's a lot of A's that can be round. The G's can be really round. So that's something that we sometimes think about with a logo is, well, what letters am I working with? When we're working with so few letters, we can really customize our logo to like work for those particular letters. So I think kind of the repeating circles here could work really well, just kind of like what we see here. Uh, but then of course, I liked that offset uh, color thing going on. So we can see here, that this, these little lines around it are just supposed to represent that we can do these kind of concentric uh, shapes around it to give it that really, really disco feel and to add a lot of color into it as well. I also think ice cream really just, you know, it's about being colorful as well. So I think uh, that works on a lot of levels. I'm gonna go ahead and lean into the, those round shapes again by putting kind of a really stylized ice cream cone on here. Now, like I was saying earlier, often we want to kind of shy away from like putting what the logo, like what the company sells in the logo. Um, it's usually not the classiest way to do it. But since this is kitschy, this is already kind of supposed to be a little bit over the top and campy. We're going to lean into it. We're going to do it. We're going to put it in there. But we're going to do a really stylized uh, version of that 
ice cream cone or gelato cone. So this is what I'm going to try to um, try to create here is something kind of along these lines that will probably change a bit uh, as we go. Um, all right, so uh, I started some some type explorations and some color explorations here to kind of get things started um, a bit. One of the mistakes that I think you know beginning designers make is that they feel like they are stuck with the fonts that are already installed on their computer and that they're stuck with the way it works when they type it out. <laughs> well, well, we're gonna customize these fonts a little bit regardless of which one we choose. So we're gonna do a little bit of customization. So it doesn't have to be the exact fit, but it needs to be something we can get to. I find another common mistake students make is that they really go like to like a bunch of free font sites and get like really low quality, crazy fonts. So here we've got ones that have a lot of personality to them, but they're well constructed. Um, they're created by professionals. And um, I can show you in a bit some font sites that might be uh, like a better place to start if you're just starting out. But here are some fonts that I'm looking at. And these are professionally developed fonts. Um, and so, you know, so, and some of them have been around for a long time and really stood, stood the test of time. So this first one here, you know, it feels kind of vaguely European to me. Um, it's got lots of character. It'd be great for, you know, something like, um, like a German themed restaurant or, um, you know, the Matterhorn at Disneyland, but it's not really very Italian and it doesn't really have those really kind of round characters that I was really liking in the inspiration. So I think that one is kind of out. This next one is a favorite of mine. Uh, this one's Cooper Black. Um, it's a very, very 70s font. So that's, you know, an automatic inspiration here. Um, a little bit of trivia. I used to have a dog named Cooper Black back, <laughs> and I guess probably more like the 80s, um, a little black like dachshund mix. Um, this font represented him very well. He was very round, very low to the ground. Um, but it's a very classic font. You probably recognize it. You've seen it in things like the Top Ramen logo <laughs> and that sort of stuff. It feels really relaxed. It feels really familiar, but maybe it's not really like stylish or disco enough for what I'm really going for here. But it's a cool one and one to kind of file away for later. Okay, so this next one feels very ice creamy. Um, you, when we see kind of a more scripty handwritten font, we often think retro, we often think handmade. Um, I love script fonts. So that's what this is that looks kind of more like hand lettering. Um, so you've probably seen this kind of stuff a lot in things like ice cream packaging because it's fun, it's light, it makes things feel handmade, it makes things feel a little bit retro and we often think a little retro for ice cream. Uh, but I think maybe it's a little too childlike for this. It's, 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 and it's not disco enough or it's not crazy enough. So I'm not sure that we're really there yet, but we're getting closer, right? I think we're getting there a little bit at a time. Um, let me know if you have a favorite in the chat, if there's one that you think we should go for here. Um, the next one here, um, this is Bella Vista. This is kind of elegant, it's open. We've got this kind of nice little space in it. It feels maybe a little French in this, instead of Italian. It doesn't feel very disco. It's not really the right one, but it's an interesting font. Um, all right, so now we go get into this one, Chalet. This one's a fun one. You've probably seen this one around a lot. It's got that those nice round O's I was looking for. And you can see like there's that nice round O in the G's as well. So we're getting a lot closer here because it's starting to feel like that kind of geometric thing that I was going for. I think it's maybe a little too modern though. And that can be good sometimes that we want a modern version, but this one we're go really going for something nuts. So I don't think it's the right one yet. Um, now we're getting, this is, this is really, really close. I think this is really very cool. It's very disco. You can just kind of imagine those concentric colors coming out of it already. Cause it just feels like a font that's supposed to do that. So I think this one's really close. This is avant-garde Gothic. Um, but if you haven't guessed already, we're going to go for this last one here because it's just so disco because it kind of got that a little bit of a retro Italian vibe to it. It's got that geometry. It's got the big fat shapes to it. 
I think it's going to be perfect. It kind of feels a little bit like that Italian poster in my um, mood board. So I think this is the one. This is called Mostra Nuovo, um, Nuova. Uh, <laughs> I'm not great in Italian, but um, that's one that I think I'm going to choose. So this is one that I was able to find in Adobe fonts. So this one is, is something that if you're a current student, you can access this font because as a student, you get a full subscription to Adobe Creative Cloud. So that means you'd be able to use Illustrator and After Effects like we're using tonight. Uh, but you also get access to all these fonts. So if you haven't done that before, um, go look up all the cool fonts that you have access to that you can activate and use in your projects. It's really easy to get there. You just go to your Adobe um, a control panel here. Um, and then fonts is somewhere in this list. And then you can go uh, find this particular font. So take advantage of that if you're a current student. And if you're not a current student, that's kind of one of the cool things that um, is part of being an academy student. All right, you can see that I also played around quite a bit with some colors here. Um, I pulled some of the colors pretty directly from my mood board. You can see here I was sampling directly some of these colors from here, trying to find an interesting color palette that felt a little bit disco, that felt a little bit electric, that felt a little bit ice cream um, in it. So here's some of the ones that you know I've explored. These are pretty bright colors. We're going to do that concentric uh, colors. It's going to be crazy. Um, so I really want to go for it. So there's a lot of options here and I think any of them would work, uh, but I think I'm going to go with this one. I think this one feels kind of modern, also kind of 70s, very ice cream uh, colors to it. Um, all right, so I'm going to now go ahead and start setting up my logo. You can see I already put my type here. I'm going to copy and paste in my color palette so I can just like sample colors from it later. Um, all right, so I like this font a lot. You can see that I've kind of um, made it so it kind of matches the same width for both lines. We usually want a logo to be, to feel pretty contained. Um, like, so something that is really long logo can be really difficult to work with. So by keeping it kind of contained, that's gonna really help us. And so by making it really um, kind of match that width, I'm doing so much other crazy stuff with this logo that keeping that nice and neat and tidy is going to really help my logo. And that's different than from my sketch. That one I was envisioning kind of a lowercase g and I would kind of have to move some of my letters out of the way in order to make it fit. But here I was able to do that. Um, so I already did that. I already also kind of brought the two lines a little closer than they are by default. Again, we want that logo to feel like really, really unified. So we don't need a big space in between it. Like if you were making a, writing a paper, uh, that's not the kind of space that we need here. We want it to be kind of tight and contained and feel like this you know, stamp or sticker of your logo instead. Um, so I like this, but I think I want to make it feel even tighter. And so one of the challenges that I feel like we have going here is that I really like these nice round G's and these nice round O's, but I feel like with all the other letters being really blocky, it's making it so that my letters, like those G's are kind of taking up kind of a lot of space. So what I think I'm gonna do is I think I'm going to like bring my letters closer together and let some of the letters overlap a little bit. That's something I saw a lot in my disco inspiration is, kind of these big fat letters that overlapped with each other um, significantly a lot of the time. So I'm going to pull that inspiration through. So the first thing that I'm going to do with this is now that I have the type kind of the size that I want, I have the font that I want, I checked my spelling to make sure I was correct, I'm going to make it so that this isn't a font anymore. Um, right now it's editable, I could change the font, I could change the size, I could change um, the spelling, I'm going to make it so it, I can't do that anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these into what we would call vector shapes. What is a vector shape? <laughs> That's maybe the first question we should answer now that we've moved into Illustrator. Um, I love Illustrator. If you're not familiar with it, it's one of Adobe's programs. Uh, you might be more familiar with Photoshop. Now, Photoshop doesn't work with vector. Uh, Photoshop, you're probably familiar with deals with pixels. I always use, in my class, I always use cupcake pictures as examples. Cupcakes and puppies 
is always the sample image. So this is just like being in my class right now, is having a cupcake picture um, as our demo. Um, so when you have a photograph, and this is clear that this is a photograph, right? When I really zoom in on it, I can see pixels. So there we go. Now I can really see the pixels. So I can see that this design, this uh, image is made up of just a whole bunch of these little boxes, these pixels. Hopefully you can see that okay um, on your screen as well. Um, and that's how a bitmap or raster image is put together. It's a whole bunch of these little boxes. That works great if you're working with a photograph. However, there's a really big challenge to this when we're working with something like a logo. Anybody guess what that is? Hopefully somebody's calling it out in the comments. But our big challenge here with using pixels is that, you know, if I try to make this my logo bigger, like maybe I need to make my logo to be big enough to be on a billboard or big enough to be on the side of a building. How do I create my logo in such a way that it's still sharp at every size that I create it? I also really need to pay attention to the way that logos are sometimes printed. Sometimes logos aren't printed in a way that we can use pixels. I, I'm just pulling up my like water bottle that I have here. I don't know if you can see this because I might carry my screen, but it has the logo and it's raised on it. If this was made in pixels, that's something that the manufacturer couldn't really do with it. So what I need instead is something called vector artwork. And that's something Photoshop doesn't do, but Illustrator does a great job at it. So let me show you kind of what vector means. To do this, I'm gonna pull up the ridiculous Christmas card I draw every year in Illustrator. It's super ridiculous. You have been warned. It is always me and my dog and we're usually in space and sometimes there's robots. So it's something I spend half an hour on every year. And this was this year's Christmas card, me and my dog baking in space. It's ridiculous, you know, whatever. So, but what you can see here, like this doesn't look like a photograph. This looks kind of a little cartoony, right? Every edge on this is sharp. There's nothing here that isn't sharp. There's nothing that kind of fades out. There's nothing like that. That's that's kind of something that you can start to tell when something is vector. And you might recognize that logos tend to feel like that as well. So I'm gonna zoom in on some of this. You know, the last time when I zoomed in on the cupcake, I got to maybe like 300 or 400% zoom uh, and it was still like, and it before it got pixelated. Here I am already zoomed in at 600% and it's still super sharp to the point where you're starting to see the mistakes that I made <laughs> that I wasn't super exact when I created this. But you know, I'm never going to get to a part where this is pixelated uh, because these shapes are shapes instead of pixels creating this image. So when I select the anything here, I basically have something called a path. And this is um, kind of more of mathematically created shape that, that that's how, um, Illustrator kind of understands how things are arranged instead of saying, okay, a blue pixel goes here, a lighter blue pixel goes here, a green pixel goes here. It remembers things like there's a point here, a point here, and a curve here. Um, so I'm going to zoom back out a little bit for this um, so you can start to see this a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, I like, let's say I want to change the curve of my frosting here. I'm just kind of adjusting the shape here. Um, and that's something we can't really do in Photoshop, but can be really important for something like a logo. So that's kind of what's happening here is that I have all of these, what we call vector shapes. They're not broken down by pixels. So just that, um, if that's something you're not familiar with, uh, that's, that's um, a, a major difference if you've used something like Photoshop or even paint or something before. Um, I love Illustrator. I think it takes a little bit to get the hang of, but I like, the perfection that you can get that really appeals to me. I like just drawing shapes in it and I like, um, yeah, so I really like Illustrator. It's probably like, it's one of my favorite things to do. All right, so now that, you know, we've looked at a little bit what vector shapes are, I'm gonna change these, um, this font into each letter being a vector shape instead. There's a lot of reasons that we will do this. One of the reasons will come in when we animate it later, we wanna be able to treat it like a shape instead of like an editable word. You know, we wanna be able to kind of make each letter, you know, do its own thing in the animation. Uh, but I also wanna kind of update these letters to fit a little bit more like what I want them to look like. 
So what I'm going to do, if you're following along, I'm going to go to type um, create outlines. Once I do this, like I have to be pretty sure I'm going to do this because once I do this, there's kind of no going back um, on this. You can do undo, but um, once you start making changes, if you misspelled something or you want to change your font, too bad, too late. So I'm going to do create outlines. So what this has done is it has made each individual letter its own shape. It's also made it into a group. If you're following along, you'll need to ungroup it with me. I'm just doing right click and choosing ungroup here. Okay, so now each letter is, is, is separate. So now I can do things like, you know, if I wanted this E to kind of go just like a little bit crazy and be like a super long E, like I can do that. <laughs> you know, I can kind of start to have a little fun with it. Maybe I want this part to kind of go back in. Um, maybe I want my L to have, you know, a bit of an angle here, for example. Those are things that I can do now that I couldn't do before. I'm gonna undo it because I don't really wanna do those in this case. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna start to kind of make my letters relate to each other just a little bit more. Let's get this back in place. All right. Um, okay, so what I wanna do, I really wanna tuck this G kind of in, into things a little bit more. So I'm gonna kind of move this in. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the kind of the shape of the E cut off the shape of the G um, a little bit so that it kind of tucks it in a little bit more. Can you see that? So I like how tucked in it is right now, but I don't like that it's touching. I still want there to be a space there. So I'm gonna move it in just a little too close. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use kind of the shape of the E to like slice off part of the G. Um, I'm gonna just copy and paste this E I just paste it right in place. Yeah. What's the name of that font again you're using? Uh, Mostra Nuova. And, and I'm using the like the thickest version of it. I'm using the black weight uh, of it. Um, thank you, Hector. Um, all right. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to pull these apart just a little bit just so we can see it. I've really made a copy of this E. So I'm going to make it a different color so we can kind of see that this is a separate one. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something called Pathfinder. This is one of my favorite things in Illustrator is where I can kind of start to combine shapes and I can start to cut shapes apart. And here, this will just be a really quick, easy way to do that. Um, so I have my G and my E. I'm going to just kind of copy and paste them so you can kind of see what's happening separately here. Um, and I'm going to pull up this window called Pathfinder. All right, so what this one, this what, what this tool does is it lets me combine shapes, it lets me like cut one shape out from another shape, uh, that sort of thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this one that's called minus front. So because my E is in front of the G, what will happen is wherever the E overlaps with the G, it will just cut that part off of the G. So there's a lot of options that you can see here and it's just kind of knowing which one is gonna work for your idea. This one is the one that works for mine, though some of these other shapes would work if you're trying to accomplish something separate. So I'm gonna select both of these and then I'm gonna do my minus front. When I do that, the E is gonna disappear. It just deletes that and everything behind it that's on the G. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Okay, so now I have a nice tight little um, G that I can really snuggle up next to the E here. Um, I'm going to just do it again here because I added that extra one um, and then just move it over a little bit. So I just want a little bit of a gap there. Not too much, uh, but just a little bit. So already it's starting to feel a little bit more complete. Um, I'm also a little bit bothered by the kind of big space we have between the L and the A. That's always a really awkward thing about how we make some of these word letter shapes work together. Uh, you might be familiar with the concept of kerning, where we want the sh kind of the sh uh, space between the shapes to feel, or between the letters to feel kind of consistent. And here we don't have that. So one thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring this L like right in really close to the A. I'm going to need to move things around a bit again, but I kind of want to make my L and my A kind of interlock in the same way my G and my E did. So I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before. I'm gonna use my A as a way to just slice into my L. So I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna paste it in front. Um, I can change it to a different color again. Okay, so now I have my two elements. And once again, I'm gonna just do minus front again. 
And now I have my L that's been cut in this kind of cool little way. Cool, right? Okay, now I'm gonna kind of tuck these together again because now we've got a big space. But that's, I think, already a pretty big improvement of where we started. This, this word already feels a little bit more compact um, in it. And I wanna do the same thing down here. So once again, I'm gonna do my exact same trick. I'm gonna copy and paste my O. Uh, I'll make it a different color. You don't have to make it a different color. I'm just trying to make it so that you can see better what's going on. Uh, I'm gonna tuck in my G to be pretty close. Okay, now I need to make sure both are selected minus front and then I can back this guy out a little bit. Okay, so I think I like that. I think I like how kind of, you know, snuggly the, these letters are starting to get with each other. Because I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste my go here um, so that I have two that are exactly the same. I don't think I'm gonna put nearly as much space in between the words either. When we have something at a small size, we need to have a lot of space in between. But here, you know, at this larger size, I think we'll be fine with something a little bit tighter in. So I'm gonna bring in my A as well. Hey, Andrea. Yeah. Can you show uh, just one more time really quickly how to transform the vector and how to navigate to that Pathfinder tool for a student? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when I started with my text, this won't look quite the same. It's a more boring font. Um, I went to type, um, oops, hold on, I need to exit out of that. Uh, type, create outlines. That's the key that turns it into vector shapes. Uh, once I do that, I'll probably need to ungroup it because it wants to keep all those letters together in case that's what I want. In this case, I don't. So I'm gonna just do right click and ungroup. Uh, and now I have a bunch of individual letters. Oops. Uh, and then to find Pathfinder, um, you go to window and choose Pathfinder. Window is everything like these little like panels and stuff that you see me using. This, this is where you can find them it is right here. So if they ever disappear, you can always find them again uh, right there. All right, hopefully that helps whoever is following along. Uh, looking forward to seeing what logo you're making. Um, all right, I, in this process, my two lines aren't really kind of the same width anymore. So I'm just gonna kind of scale it a little bit so they're a little bit closer to the same size again. I think that's pretty good. I might bring the two lines in a little closer again. Now, the one last thing that I think I wanna do here is I've got kind of these like teeny little, like middle of the O's. I've got these teeny little parts on the A. You know, when I was doing my concept, I was thinking of kind of more solid letters. So I'm just gonna get rid of like the middle of these O's. I'm gonna get rid of this little kind of little teeny little cutout part of the A. So what I'm gonna do is again, I'm going to start to edit my shapes. Now every vector shape is made up of a bunch of points. So I'm on my, what's called the direct selection tool here. This allows me to edit individual points of each letter. Oops, I was supposed to prove that I could do that. So I can here I can edit individual points. So um, I'm gonna, kind of go in to my A here. And I can see that there's you know, some extra little points that I can just delete and it will just become like a triangle at that point. And I can do the same thing with the O's. So I'm gonna to go to what's called the pen tool. Pen tool is what allows me to add and remove points. It's one of the most frustrating tools in Illustrator, the hardest to get the hang of, but then once you get the hang of it, your whole life revolves around it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, I always find students in the beginning, when I make them learn the pen tool, they're a little frustrated, but then by the end, they do some pretty cool stuff with it. All right, so I'm on the pen tool. And since I'm over an existing point, it understands that I probably just wanna delete it. So I'm just gonna start deleting these extra points. And you can see that already it's closer to just being a triangle. I can just get rid of these ones too. Oops. It's misunderstanding what I'm doing here. Let's see. It wants me to start something new now. So I can just in the meantime kind of do this, which works. I do have a bunch of extra points, which bothers me, um, but I'm not going to make you guys watch while I try to make it uh, behave <laughs> on that one. So it's, I, I got my triangle, uh, that's what I wanted. So we're good to go. All right, now I'm gonna do the same thing for my O's. I'm just gonna start deleting points that I don't need kind of highlight this so we can see what we're doing. 
Okay. I'm just going to just start getting rid of the points that I don't need anymore. Okay, now we just got a circle. Same thing here. Oops. I'll highlight this again so I don't have that problem. Okay, now I've got another circle. I think I've got one or two left uh, to get rid of. I think in this one I can just hit my delete key. There we go. Same thing on my A. Oops. Now I can try to delete these. Uh, it works this time. There we go. Okay, so now I just have the three points for my triangle, which is what I was trying to do in the first place. Okay, I'm gonna kind of zoom back out a little bit. All right, what do you guys think? Get rid of this extra stuff. It's looking pretty 70s now, right? I think once we add some color, it will look crazy 70s. Um, I also kind of want to make a, my little ice cream, my little stylized ice cream cone next to it. And I can draw my own circles and triangles, but I already have those shapes in my logo. So I'm going to just kind of pull these from it. So I've got, here's my circle for my ice cream cone. I'm just copying and pasting this a couple times. I'm gonna kind of need to edit the size. And then I'm gonna make just my cone out of this one right here. That's something nice whenever in a logo we can kind of like echo some of the same shapes. Uh, that's something that feels really kind of comfortable. So there's that huge ice cream cone. I don't think I want it quite this big. I'm gonna to start to scale these down a little bit. So I get kind of more of like the snowman shape ice cream cone. Uh, let's see. All right, maybe something a little bit more like that. Still pretty big, but I'm gonna kind of lean into it a little bit. Okay, so I've got, here's my big ice cream. That's too big. I'm gonna scale it down a little bit. All right, I think that's a little bit better. Okay, now I'm gonna start, like I think this is a fun place to start applying my crazy color palette. If you remember this one that I pulled before? I'm just gonna drag this over. Um, I like having just like my little color palette ready to go. It makes it so that when I'm making decisions about color, I have already made that decision. It's a lot harder to try to like apply it and see if you like it and start to do it while you're doing this part of the design process. The more that we can do before we get into Illustrator, the better off we're gonna be. So that's something that takes a little bit of practice to get used to is coming up with your concept in that ideation stage and then using this for refining instead. So I'm going to just start pulling in um, some of these colors. So I'm just gonna use my little eyedropper tool to kind of pull in my colors to my ice cream cone. It's gonna be crazy. You can see it already coming into place here. Um, here's my little cone. Now the order on this is a little bit weird. I want kind of the these top scoops to seem like they're in the front. So I'm just going to um, use my layers panel here. So I went to window layers. Uh, here I've got, you can see like all the shapes that I have here. Here's every individual letter. Here's my different ice cream cone scoops. Here's my like swatches. That's gonna be important later when we go to animate it. We need to have these as, um, we need to have these as separate shapes and we'll have to put them as separate layers in a bit. But I'm gonna just kind of rearrange the order here so that it kind of feels a little bit more ice cream coney um, by having those scoops kind of feel like they're sitting on top. All right, so I'm getting pretty close. Uh, now I wanna add my kind of concentric colors. We call that an offset path. Uh, like anything in these, these um, like in Illustrator and Photoshop uh, software tools, there's usually a lot of ways to do the same thing. So I'm gonna show you a way to do it. Um, this way that I'm gonna do it is gonna be pretty specifically because I want it to be a really solid shape when I go into um, uh, After Effects, when Nikki starts to animate it. We wanna have those be separate shapes. One really easy way would just be to put an outline and an outline and an outline and an outline on it. That would be a really easy way to do it, but it wouldn't work very well when we're trying to animate it later. So we want each kind of outline to be its own kind of blocky shape. So I'm gonna do it in a way that will make sure that that happens. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with my logo as a, my logo type. That's the part of the logo that is the type. Uh, we call this other part 
the logo mark and they're often together and sometimes the logo is just one or the other. In this case, we have both. Um, all right, so I'm going to just take this as a group. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this whole group um, so that when I add my extra color to it, it has all of the curves and stuff that I need for it. So I'm going to copy this entire group um, and I'm gonna paste it exactly on top of each other. You see, I've done this a whole lot of times where I do paste in front or paste in back instead of just regular paste. Paste will just kind of put it in the middle. Since I want everything to line up with each other, I'm using these in instead so that it lines up perfectly. So when I do this, it won't look like anything has just happened <laughs> because I'm just stacking it on top of it, the other one. But we'll see in the layers panel that it's there. Okay, so I'm doing paste in front. So now we can see in my layers panel, a whole new set of these letters just popped up. As long as these are selected, I'm gonna move this to a whole new layer to make sure that I can kind of separate these things pretty well. So I'm just gonna take all of my new set here, and move it into this other layer. The advantage of this is first, it will help in After Effects later, but also now I can kind of get like the other one out of the way. If I need to, I can kind of just turn off everything else if it's bothering me um, and kind of make sure that I'm working on things or I can make sure that I don't accidentally edit my original version so I think that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm just locking this layer into place so that I don't accidentally change the color of that one too. Okay, so now I have this one selected. Like I said, there's a few ways that we can do this. I'm gonna use something called offset path for this. Um, I can do this in a couple of different places, but I'm gonna just go to effect uh, path and choose offset path here. When I do that, this little thing pops up. You can already see it's starting to do it. Um, I have, it's already starting to look a little bit more disco just because that line got thicker. Um, and I can choose exactly how thick I want that to be. I don't think I want it quite this thick since I'm gonna do a lot of kind of concentric parts to it. So I'm gonna do more like six. I can then choose kind of how it's dealing with the corners. So you can see here that my A became really, really pointy. When I looked at my, my mood board, my inspiration, everything was really, really rounded. Um, so I'm going to choose round instead. So you can see it kind of rounded off that really pointy part. So I think I'm going to like that a little bit better. So I'm going to say, okay. Um, all right, now I can go ahead and add my color to it. I think I'm going to do pink on the first round. That's <laughs> really pink, isn't it? Um, so now I can start to see how these two layers go together, right? So I've got my original here and now I can see that first concentric thing starting to form. I don't think I want this to actually be black here. I think I want this uh, to be white. So I'm going to lock my pink layer really quick so I can select this and then choose white. So all right, so we're start we're, we're, we're a good part of the way there at this point. Uh, we're just going to make it crazier uh, as we go as we go now. Um, one thing that I do think I want to do here, so it will make it easier for Nikki when she gets later, right now these are still separate shapes. Um, if I try to edit these, oops, it's locked, that's my one, let me do it. Andrea, uh, these are still you have some separate questions shapes. about the offset stroke and how you, or the offset path and how you access that I think is what everyone's kind of asking you to redo or explain yeah. again. I'm going to do the offset path a whole bunch of times in a row. So you'll see it again, I promise. <laughs> because that's a good question. I did go by that pretty fast. But I'm going to do it since we're going to do like four or five kind of concentric things here. Um, all right. So right now, each of these letters is individual. And later, when uh, Nikki animates it, I want it to kind of work as like one kind of blob type shape. So I'm going to go ahead and use my Pathfinder again to combine these all into one shape. So I'm going to just select everything. And I'm gonna use this one here, Unite. That just combines everything into like, from being separate shapes into one thing. It has one outline around it instead of each individual outline. Okay. All right, so it doesn't look like anything happened, but when I select it, oops, maybe nothing did happen. Hold on, let me try that again. Um, I might need to, is it one shape now? I think it is. It just looks like there's a lot of extra points in there, probably because I need to expand the appearance. So right now it's still treating this as an editable thing. I can edit how big my offset path is. If I decided I didn't like it, I can go to appearance and change it. 
Oops, where is it? Um, but I, I don't want it to retain that for now. So I'm just gonna say for it to kind of just make an outline of this. So I'm gonna do um, object expand appearance. So now I should just have one outline around everything. It's still not behaving exactly the way that I expected. I think things are overlapping differently, but uh, it's pretty close. I can see here that it's kind of still has a couple of shapes. As we go, I think that will start to fall apart. Okay, so now I have this one. Let's add another offset path. So I'm gonna just copy my whole thing here. I'm gonna hide this one and just focus on this one here. All right, so now I'm gonna do the exact same thing again. So if you missed it before how I did offset path, here it is. I'm going up to effect and I'm choosing path and then offset path. You'll see that there's a whole lot of crazy stuff in here that's just fun to play around with. This is one that you might not use that often, but it's here for when you need it. I can kind of just change an existing path and make it thicker. So I'm doing my offset path. Again, I want to do about six here because I want it to be pretty um, equal when I do it and I'm going to do round again. Okay. So um, once again, I wanna make sure that I'm expanding my appearance just so it becomes kind of more one shape. And I'm gonna do my Pathfinder again to kind of just make this all into one shape for sure. Okay. All right, now that's definitely just one shape that's happening. Um, all right, so it's hard to tell because I haven't added the color to it yet. Um, but we'll be able to add this in, in just a second. So I'm going to select this and kind of pick my next color here. Oops. Oh, I need to rearrange the order. Hold on. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull this color. There we go. Now we're starting to see this really starting to come together, right? Okay. Hold on, we're gonna do a couple more of these and then uh, we'll add it to our ice cream cone and then we'll be pretty close to hand it over to Nikki uh, to animate it and have a little bit of fun with it. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna just copy this layer. I'm gonna make sure that this layer is selected. I'm gonna do my offset path again, add it in. There's another one. I want it to be the same thickness for every single one. Round, okay. And then I'm gonna plug in my next color. Hey, there we go. It's starting to look pretty good, I think. Uh, very disco happening. Um, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it again. I want to add my green color in here as well. I'm gonna once again select it. Now this time I'm gonna do it a little bit differently to show you that there's this new thing up here that says apply offset path. That means that it's gonna take my settings from last time and it's gonna apply it. So we've, I've done the six points each time. I've done the rounded each time. I could go back and do it again here, but if I just choose apply offset path here, it'll take all of my settings from last time. So that saves me a couple seconds if it's something that I do a lot. So I'm gonna do apply offset path. Oops, I forgot to expand this last one. So let me expand exp appearance on this one and then do it. All right. So I'm going to do now apply offset path. There we go. Uh, and then I'm gonna add in my <laughs> new color. <laughs> How disco is this looking? I'm gonna do one more. I'm gonna just add one more of the bright pink and then we can move on. Now, as I'm doing this, we can also do it in a different way here. I can also do it from my appearance setting and just kind of add another one. So I'm gonna do it that way next, just so you can see that there's a lot of ways to do the exact same thing. So now while I have this one selected, I'm gonna take the offset path that's already there and I'm gonna just drag it to this new effect thing where it's just gonna copy what I have there. So now I can just go and pull my color again. So I, if that was one that's too much, like, um, like that's just an extra way to do it. We can still go to effect, uh, path and uh, um, uh, uh, offset. All right, so I think this is looking just as electric disco as I was going for in the original. So now I'm gonna do the same thing here on my um, ice cream cone. Um, all right, so I have this layer locked, I need to unlock it. I just had locked it so I didn't accidentally mess up anything, which is something I do a lot. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this and I'm going to, um, I need to copy this shape. Now it will be a little bit more obvious when I combine the shape this time since they're all different colors. Before, 
it was kind of maybe a little hard to tell because they were all letters of the same color. Here it will be a little bit more obvious. So if you didn't miss it before, it will be more obvious this time. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste in front. And now I need to combine this into one shape. Um, so I'm going to use my Pathfinder again. Um, and I'm going to use the Unite. And it's going to pick one of the colors. I, I am not generally very good at guessing which color it's going to pick. I think it usually picks the one that's in the front. So I think it's the pink in the front. Yeah, I was right. So it was pink on this one. All right, so now I, ha I still have my original ice cream cone underneath, uh, but I'm going to do my um, uh, offset path here again. So effect, apply offset path. My settings were already there. Uh, now I need to start to kind of rearrange things a little bit. I'm going to add a new layer for this to go into and then rearrange things a little bit so it kind of appears in the right order. All right, there we go. Now a challenge that I have here is all of my colors in my color palette are already being used in my ice cream cone. So this is gonna be a little bit weird if I do outline it in one of those colors. So I think I'm gonna make this outline white. Um, so kind of mimic what we've got going here. So I'm not gonna make it white yet because we won't be able to see it then, but I'm gonna go ahead and copy this layer apply my offset path. Oops, I forgot to expand it again. Expand appearance, there we go. Now I can easily apply my offset path and start to pick uh, my next color. Okay, all right. So now I can go back to this one and make it white to make it work. Okay, oops, I did the wrong one, here we go. I got my order a little bit mixed up in this, uh, <laughs> which one is it? <laughs> I made the wrong color. Oh, here we go. Okay, this one needs to be white. The next one needs to be pink. Okay, I'm gonna select this one now. This is the one that's gonna be pink. There we go, that's what I was trying to do. Um, I'm trying to remember if that's really the color I wanted this one to be. Let me see, I think. Um, I'm actually going to do, I want it to be these, these last three colors here. So I'm actually going to do this one in blue instead. Okay, changed my mind. Okay, so we're almost there. Um, I know it feels a little repetitive at this point. This is something that is part of being a designer is that there's a certain amount of being repetitive in it. But once you see the animated results, it will be totally, totally worth it. So I'm going to copy this again. Um, I'm going to make sure I expand my appearance so that I can add another uh, offset path here. Uh, this time I'm going to go with the green. And then here's my last time doing this. Um, expand appearance. And this time I'm going to pick the pink again. Oops. It was on the wrong one. Expand appearance. I hope it makes you feel better to see me making mistakes too, because then when you make your mistakes, you'll know that you're in good company, that that's something that we that just happens um for everybody okay so i have all the parts to my logo so i think i'm pretty close however it does feel a little static um, and that's what i had in my sketch before but one thing that i want to do is i want to kind of add some angles to it when we saw that my mood board there was a lot of stuff that had kind of some angles and things going in it so i'm going to just add one more level of crazy to our logo here and start to rotate things just a little bit so I'm gonna take this whole thing, I'm just selecting all of it. I'm just gonna rotate it a little bit, oops. Come on, if it wants to, it's thinking about it. There we go. Okay, so I think maybe like that, that adds a little bit more energy to it, doesn't it? This is something that as designers, we have to kind of think about is how, do, how we add things like energy or how we add excitement to something. And often the first uh, instinct is to add more stuff to it, but often it's as simple as something like an angle changing to do it. I'm gonna make this one a little bit of an angle too and kind of like stack them on top of each other a little bit. All right, what do you guys think of my insane logo? Pretty fun, right? It's great. It's great. <laughs> All right, this is not the kind of logo, I've, we're having a little fun tonight when we do apps and things, we usually don't get to go uh, this colorful. So hopefully um, it adds a little bit of inspiration there. So you can see how I've started to like um, put all each element on separate layers. 
What would I also want to do is put each individual letter on separate layers as well. And here's the little spoiler. We already did that for you earlier, so you don't have to watch us do that. But that means that my part is done and that we're going to pass it over to Nikki to now bring it even more to life, add a little bit of sparkle, add some motion to it. So take it away, Nikki. All Let's right. My screen. There you go. Yeah, I'm going to pull up my screen. All right, can you guys see it? Yeah. All right, so just like magic, Andrea's logo has made it to my computer. <laughs> and I just wanted to kind of reiterate a bit on how to set up your files in order to bring them into Adobe After Effects because um, it's really important. It's the first thing that I teach my motion students is how to uh, set up their layers, name their layers and stay insanely organized. And I think it will become pretty obvious why that's so important once we get into After Effects. Um, but it's also the part of uh, the first part to conceptualizing exactly how you how you plan to animate your logo. Uh, the cool thing about animation is that there is no one way to do it. Um, everyone kind of has their own method to how they choose to animate and their own ideas and their own pathway to get to where they want to get to. Um, but the first kind of thing is is to understand like what pieces am I going to be animating. And in this case, I want to keep it as open as possible to animate literally every layer that's here if I want to do so. So what I've done is over in my layers, um, I've separated each individual piece and put it on its own layer. And in doing so, I've also labeled it exactly what it is so that when I bring these layers into After Effects, I know exactly what I'm working with. And that just makes my workflow a lot easier uh, things don't get lost in the shuffle. Um, and so sometimes when you're receiving, if you're working, if you're doing motion work for clients, you'll receive just like a flat file. Everything's going to be all kind of lumped together. And the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to open it up and you're going to break it apart in Illustrator into all of these different layers. You're going to label them so that when we do come over to After Effects, we can pull that in and see all of our layers. So I'm in After Effects here. Um, and the first thing I want to do is I'm going to import uh, the logo. So I'm just going to go to file, import, file. Um, and I'm going to grab my Gelato final logo with the layers. So I've labeled it layers because I know that this is the file that I've broken apart into all of the different layers with all of the different labelings. Um, there's a few different ways to import into After Effects. And you see those under the import as footage. Um, composition, retain layer sizes, and composition. In this case, I want to retain layer sizes. And, and what that means is that there's going to be a little bounding box around each individual layer. That might sound a little confusing, but I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open that. And it's going to uh, import itself into my project panel here. Um, and you'll notice that it has immediately put itself into a composition. I'm probably saying a lot of words that don't really make sense to you if you've never used Illustrator before. Uh, Illustrator is quite the program. It's amazing. It literally can probably do anything that you can think of in creating motion. Um, After Effects is the main motion or animation software that we use in our department. Um, and it still is the number one leading program for motion. Um, there's a few different types of motion that we do in our programs. Uh, we do motion graphics, right? Which is kind of what we're doing here where we're animating a logo um, and we can create GIFs, right? We can use those on our websites. We can have an animated logo at the top of our website. Um, we can make things move and make things really fun. Another kind of up and coming type of motion is uh, creating animated user experiences or animating a user interface. Um, and so we'll do a lot of that as well, um, especially in uh, the web design new media department. We animate a lot of our user experience to kind of show how people click and move through the types of designs that we're creating. Um, so those are the types of motion that we do. And, and After Effects is a great program for that. Of course, there's other you know, types of animation softwares for 3D type of animation. That's not necessarily what we're doing here. Um, so After Effects is gonna be our software of choice. 
And it's great because it's an Adobe software, so it links really easily to Illustrator and uh, Photoshop and anything that you're creating graphics in, you can easily bring into After Effects um, like I've done here. So I've created my file and I just double click to open it. And what you'll notice here is that on my timeline, I have a layer for every layer that I separated out in Illustrator. And it comes in with all of the little labels that I gave it. So I know that this is my cone layer. So if I click on it, it's going to highlight the cone. Um, and this allows me to go through and animate all of these different layers. Um, so I think, you know, the again, like I was kind of saying earlier, how you decide to start or where you decide to start is kind of up to you and your process. It kind of comes along with um, learning a software and, and practicing using a software. But I think um, the first thing that I want to do is kind of consider all of my different options for this logo style. So we kind of went through those keywords when Andrea was uh, making the logo, um, electric, fun, funky, disco. And so I kind of think that something bright and fun and bouncy and snappy would kind of go along with that type, this design. So I think that what I wanna do is I wanna start with the text because that's gonna be kind of the main thing that's going to attract attention um, and get the user kind of reading the logo. So I wanna start by animating the text and then I'll kind of get into the other pieces later. So what I can do in the timeline is I can turn things off to focus on certain aspects. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come in here. I'm gonna turn everything off except for the text so that I can just focus on animating the text. Um, when I open up a certain layer here, so we'll start with the G, I have a bunch of different transform tools. So I can animate the position, the scale, I can make things rotate, I can make them um, fade in, fade out, things like that. So what I was kind of thinking uh, when I was thinking of like things bouncing in was kind of creating a bouncing of the text onto the screen. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with just animating the G and then I'll go through, I'll see if I like that and then I'll go through and add that same animation to the rest of the layers. So um, this is the timeline in After Effects and the way that we create animation is by adding what we call keyframes to the timeline. So for example, let's go ahead and create a scaling sort of bounce on the G and I'm going to do so with the scaling property here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this little stopwatch here. I'm going to add, you can see it adds a little tiny little keyframe onto my timeline. And what that keyframe is saying is that the scale is 100%. I don't want to start with the scale 100% because I want it to sort of bounce in from zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this keyframe to 0% and you're going to see the G disappear. And then I'm going to come over a few keyframes and I'm going to, um, I think I want to have it like scale past 100% to get like a little bounce action. So I'm gonna change this to um, 115. So just a little bit over 100%. So now you'll see that I'm going from zero to 115%. And then I to continue my sort of bounce, I'm gonna come over just a couple keyframes here. Um, I'll take it down to 90%. And then I'll come another keyframe over and go to 100. So now I have an animation where I've gone from 0% scale up to 115%, down to 90%, and then kind of meeting back at the 100%. So if I preview this, I'm just gonna shorten, we're getting a little bounce as the G comes into place. So that's, I think, off to a good start. The timing looks good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add some easing and easing in After Effects is a way to create a smoother animation. You can have things ease in so they're kind of slowing down as they enter. You can have them ease out where they're getting faster as they enter. So kind of like splatting onto screen. Um, and then there's an option for 
easy ease, which is kind of just a general um, feeling of motion. And it kind of adds just a nice wave of motion as the G is kind of coming in. So what I can do is I'm just right clicking. I have all of my keyframes selected. I'm gonna right click and the keyframe assistant is where I can say easy ease. Um, so now it's just gonna add a nice little easing motion as my G pops into the screen. So I'm liking what that looks like. Um, what I think might be cool is and might be a little funky is if instead of scaling if you'll notice i'll zoom in a little bit for you guys um it's scaling from the center so this right here is considered an anchor point essentially and so what's happening is the scaling is happening around that anchor point um, i can move that anchor point because there's this great tool here uh, it's called the pan behind tool but it's the anchor point tool it has two names it's kind of confusing but if I select that, it allows me to pick up my anchor point and I can move it to these different areas. I can move it wherever I want, but it tends to want to snap to the outer um, bounding box of the layer. So now that I've changed that, you'll see that the scaling is happening from the bottom corner here. And what I kind of imagined when I was thinking about this animation was the one letter kind of pushing into the next letter as they all kind of scaled and popped open. Um, so I feel good about this animation. Let me know what you guys think so far. Um, I like this motion coming from the corner here. And so what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to overlap the letters as they sort of pop in. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the E and what's really great is that I can select keyframes, I can copy, I'm gonna command to see, I'm gonna use my keyboard shortcuts. I'm gonna select my layer E and I'm going to command V to paste. Now, if I open up that layer, I can see that the keyframes in the same sequence, uh, so 0% scale to bouncing 115 to 90 to 100, now I have an E with the same sort of scaling motion on it. Notice that it didn't copy over where I moved my anchor point to though. So I do have it scaling from the center. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to move it down to the bottom corner of my E. And now if I preview, I'm seeing both the G and the E animate in similarly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through um, and I am going to copy and paste again so I can grab these. So it does get a little bit repetitive, but what I'm doing is I'm overlapping my animations a little bit. So notice that I'm not coming to the end of the G um, and then pasting here. I want the E to get started while the G is still kind of working its way in. Um, and this creates kind of a sequential animation where things are overlapping and nothing ever kind of feels too stagnant. Um, so now I have the, that same animation applied to the L I'm going to move my anchor point and then I'm just going to continue moving forward. I think I just copied it to the wrong layer. So we're just going to pick these up and move them and you can just slide them along your timeline here. Um, there's this great feature down here where we can zoom in and out of our timeline to get really close to our keyframes or a bit further away. So I'm on the A here. I'm going to move my anchor point. And then I'm going to come to the T and I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm just going to try and kind of speed through this. All right, so at this point, we should have the whole word gelato kind of doing the same thing here. So it feels a little bit slow, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish um, adding the same animation to the rest of my letters. And actually, I'm just going to, I already did it. So instead of going through that process, I'll show you kind of what I ended up with.
All right, so this is the same. This is the same thing that I was just showing you how to do. However, I finished adding the keyframes to all of the letters here. Um, and then I shortened it to about two seconds of animation. Uh, usually when you're doing a logo animation, it's gonna be about under five seconds. Um, and so considering that I still have a bunch of other layers that I need to animate, I wanted to keep this part relatively quick. Um, I think animators actually tend to have things be a little bit too long because they either choose not to overlap their animations um, or just make everything kind of happen in slow motion. So here I have just the simple popping kind of in scaling animation that I applied to all of the different letters. All right, so um, one really great thing about After Effects is that it allows you to stay really organized within. Um, it does kind of get a little crazy, like you might be looking at this timeline thinking that's a lot of layers. Uh, it is, and it gets even more confusing when you're creating like an entire commercial or like a concept video. Um, so that again is where uh, naming, making sure that you're labeling your layers comes in really handy and um, keeping things where they need to be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just, don't look, I'm gonna delete those and I'm gonna bring in my text animation and I'm just gonna plop them in there. So now I have my text in here in my main composition. And if I start to turn on my other layers, there we go. So now we're seeing the colored layers behind the, the text. So it's gonna look something like this when it's popping into the colors behind it. So now we kind of have to figure out like, what are we gonna do? I, I like this animation. Now I need to figure out what I can do with the rest of the layers to sort of add to the character of this logo animation. So I'm thinking what would be cool is if the main shape in the background kind of starts scaled like really big and maybe fills the entire screen and then can kind of like splat down into place. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna show you what I mean. <laughs> Um, and so I think what I'm going to start with is the pink layer here and I'm going to just open up my scale. Again, I'm using my keyboard shortcuts, but if I hit S on my keyboard, it's going to pop up just the scale. Um, when I'm working with a lot of layers, I like to use my keyboard shortcuts because uh, instead of having to open transform and look through all of these different things and have all of these open. And if I had all of those open all the way up the list here. I would be scrolling really far down my timeline. So it's really nice, you know, the more comfortable you get in these programs, being able to use keyboard shortcuts to help kind of speed up your workflow. So I'm gonna be working with scale. Um, and what I'm thinking about doing is starting it, like I said, really big. So I'm just going to scale way, way, way up until the pink completely fills the stage. So the stage is this area, the composition, right? That we're working in. So now that I have it scaled way up, I have it at 493%, um, it fills the entire screen. And so what I wanna do, and I'm not sure like how quickly I want it to happen, but I want it to have kind of like a similar bounce situation where it kind of splats onto the screen quickly and kind of bounces into place. And then we'll have the text kind of start animating in once that happens. So I've already set my keyframe here at zero frames because this is going to be the first thing that happens. So I'm kind of working backwards a little bit. So this kind of goes back to like starting where you want to start and like rearranging and organizing things to kind of fit your concept. So I know that I'm going to have to move my text. My text isn't going to start right away, but that's okay for now. So I've added a keyframe um, to scale at almost 500%. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to have it um, go down to maybe like 75%. So we're starting big, we're scaling down, we're kind of having it hit, and then we'll have it scale back up to 100. So we won't add like too much of a bounce to it, but just kind of a simple uh, scale down, bounce back up. And let's just go ahead and see speed on that. All right, so I think that it looks good as it comes and hits, but then the bounce kind of feels a little bit slow. 
So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this last keyframe and I'm just going to scoot it in a little bit and then preview again. And I think that looks good, but um, maybe adding some easing, right? So I talked a little bit about easing before. Uh, and I think in this case, maybe adding an ease in is going to help it hit a little bit harder. All right, so it hits and then kind of bounces out. That still feels a little bit slow to me on the bounce back, so I'm going to just adjust it one more time. All right, that's looking good. Now, I do have other layers, the offset paths that Andrea created that I have to figure out how I want those to kind of come in as well. I could, you know, I don't know, have them like possibly, I, I don't know, we could have them fade in, um, we could have them position in differently. But what I'm thinking is maybe just having them be a part of how this pink layer comes in to begin with. So maybe instead, um, and this kind of goes back to how I organized my layers, maybe instead of splitting all of these apart, I could have just put them all onto one layer. So my one layer would have looked um, like this without the text. And I could have just animated this whole thing kind of splatting on. Um, and I think that that's going to be better than trying to get all of these other layers to kind of have an interesting animation that fits kind of what I've created so far. So there's an easy way in After Effects to kind of make up for the fact that all of these are currently on different layers and that tool is called parenting. Um, it's kind of a, an interesting tool name, but basically what it means is that you're linking all of these layers together so that you've already created an animation, I'm going to parent the layers to that animation that, and that layer that I created so that they all do the same thing. So um, it's actually a really fun little tool because it's this little, what they call a pick whip. And um, what you can do is you can pull on it and you can select what layers you want to parent to. So what I've done is I've selected the green, kind of teal, red, and this other pink layer. Um, and I know that because I labeled them all so that I know. And I'm just going to pick whip and I'm gonna select that first pink layer that I created that animation to. So now you'll see that they're all moving together. So if we look at the animation now, it's bouncing into place uh, and that's looking pretty cool. And then I think once that finishes, we can have the, the text animation start. Um, but now I, now that I've done that, I noticed that up at 493%, we're not fully seeing just one color. We're kind of seeing a little bit of everything. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to edit this one keyframe and I'm just going to continue zooming. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention while I'm zooming is notice that we're seeing uh, what Andrea was talking a little bit about. We were talking about pixelization and bit mapping and stuff like that. But we know that Andrea purposefully created vector files for us so that our files can be, our layers can be huge and they're going to have these sharp edges. We're not going to have to deal with um, pixelization like we're seeing here. Um, for whatever reason, After Effects, when you bring files in, it knows that it's an Illustrator file. It knows that it's a vector file. Um, but I think it takes, you know, a little bit extra computing for it to show it super crisp. So what we actually have to do is we have to take another step in order to um, rasterize our layers so that they're seeing them as a vector and we're not getting this sort of blurring. Um, and that is this little guy here. It's called four comp layer um, for vector layers and we just need to turn it on. I call it the sun because it looks like a sun. Uh, and what you have to do is you just have to check that box. And I'm going to check that box for all of my layers and notice how it goes from blurry to sharp. And I'm just going to show you with the red layer here. Oh, that's the wrong layer. There you go. So we're going from blurry to sharp. So we've turned it on so that it's seeing it as a vector. So we're getting that sharp, clean line uh, that we created in Illustrator. And now I'm just going to continue kind of scaling up until all we're seeing is this pink. 
and now we're like very big, right? We're at like 4,000, 5,000, 6,000%. And so this might also uh, cause my animation to maybe look a little bit fast, but let's go ahead and see what it looks like. Now it's really kind of splatting into place, right? So maybe we need to adjust our keyframes just a little bit since we're starting from so much further away. I'm just gonna grab these and move them a little bit and play with the timing on that. All right, I think that looks pretty good. I don't know what you guys think. I can't see the chat, so I don't know if you're liking this or not, but uh, <laughs> I think that looks pretty cool. I'm going to now come over to where it finally settles into place and I'm going to come back to my text and I'm just going to move my text layer. So again, we can pick up layers and we can move them. Um, and I'm gonna have my text animation start right when this kind of settles into place. Now I just need to expand. Where is it? Oh, gotta turn my eyeball on. There we go. All right, so now we've got most of the logo animated. I'm liking how it looks. And so now I kind of just need to conceptualize what I want to do with that ice cream cone. So what I'll do is I'll come to about the end of my text animation here and we'll start to think about our ice cream. So I'm going to turn on my ice cream layers. I think we'll worry about the ice cream itself and then think about those outer layers after. Um, all right, so the cone. Maybe we could do a simple scale. We could do an opacity kind of thing where we have it fade in. Um, I'm thinking maybe we have, we do some positioning and maybe we have the cone kind of slide into place maybe from the bottom, from down here. And then maybe we can have the ice creams kind of come in from the top and meet it. And so I'm gonna try that and see what it looks like. I'm gonna hit P on my keyboard to pull up my position. And I'm going to add a keyframe by just clicking on my stopwatch. And so I know that this is where I want my final placement to be. So I'm just gonna move this keyframe down the timeline a little bit. And then I'm going to add a new keyframe. And so a cool thing that I can do is I don't have to make my adjustments from here. I can click my layer and I can drag it and it's going to show you the motion path. Um, and so where it's starting and where it's ending. And um, so I'm going to kind of just pull it off the screen here. And the animation is going to look something like that. So it's kind of sliding in from off the stage. Um, I'm just going to add some easing to that. So I'll just do an easy ease, which again is just going to be kind of a general ease, um, not to get too in depth, but if I hit this little graph, this is kind of how the movement of that uh, animation looks, how we start and how we're kind of easing our way from one keyframe to the next. So more advanced would be that you can create your own easing. You don't have to use the presets of easy ease or ease in or ease out. We can create our own types of animations um, and our own easing by using the graph editor. So let's see kind of how this is looking. We've got the cone kind of coming into place. Maybe it just needs to be a little bit faster. And then we can kind of start also bringing in those ice creams as well. So we'll start with the blue and maybe the blue meets the ice cream cone as it comes in at the same time. So I know that my ice cream cone finishes its animation right here. I'm just gonna add a position keyframe right here for my blue ice cream. And then I'm going to come back in time and I'm going to change the position to be off the screen right here. Again, I'm just going to add some easing. And we're going to see them kind of come into place. 
And then I think once my, once those meet, I can bring in the red next. So again, just gonna change the position. I know that that's my final placement. Um, and we'll start it up here. So now we have those meeting in place and then the next ones are going to drop in after that. And the last one here, we might want to overlap these, but we're just going to start with our simple keyframes and then kind of see what that looks like. So again, the cool thing about animation is that there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Um, it's all about just how it feels and how it looks. That's not too bad. They come in a little bit fast. We can try overlapping them too and see if that looks better. I like that a little bit better. We can also do instead of the easy ease, we can think about easing in so that they drop in a little bit faster or that they ease into place or ease out. Um, but I think, you know, for the purpose of this, that's looking pretty good. So I think the last thing then that we have are the outlines kind of around the ice cream cone. So I'll turn those on. Um, and similar to before, I think just for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to parent everything. So I'm going to connect all of those outlined layers together. Um, and so that we can do kind of one animation and that they'll all kind of work together. So I'm going to use my pick whip tool and I'm going to parent everything to this pink layer here. And the only thing we haven't done, I think at this point is like an opacity or transparency, right? So having something fade in. So maybe we'll try a fade in and maybe it will start to fade in um, as these kind of ice cream are falling in. So I'll start with an opacity of 0% and I'm just going to add a keyframe for 0% opacity and then I'll have it kind of finish a little bit after the last ice cream falls in at 100% and we'll see what that looks like. That didn't work. Why not? What we can do is we can move our layers like that. Oh, I think it's because I parented before. So let's go back. And now that we've added our opacity animation here, we can parent the rest and see if that works. No, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Let's see. So kind of one more thing that Andrea talked about is sometimes things don't work as you planned and then you just have to figure out why. <laughs> so one other thing that we can do is we can just simply copy and paste, right? We know that we have our opacity keyframes that are going from 0% to 100%. And so what I can do is I can just come on to my other layers here and I can paste that same animation. And now they're all fading in together. All right, so let's check out our final animation. Not bad. So the last thing that I would want to do is maybe change the background of my composition from black to something like white. That could help. Um, you can also add, you know, create layers in After Effects as well. So while we created our layers and the logo in Illustrator, After Effects has the ability to create shapes um, as well, just as Illustrator does really, there's the pen tool. So we talked a lot about the pen tool and I was talking in the chat about how the pen tool works similarly in pretty, many, pretty much all Adobe software. Uh, so it's really great once you learn it and I would suggest learning it first in Illustrator. Once you learn it, you can utilize it similarly 
across the board, which is really great. Um, we can also create text layers and shape layers in After Effects and have the ability to animate all different types of um, properties of those shapes and layers as well. I think that's it. Awesome, looks great. Were there any questions that I could answer? I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good jobs and really cool. Cool. Someone said you made it look sexy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We have great. We have all kinds of stuff. So really cool. Awesome. It's awesome to just see it all come to life too. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure that it's years of work and practice, but to be able to put something like this together as a team in an hour and a half is pretty awesome too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, lots of practice, lots of learning. Um, but this is like our first motion class, right? So if, when you come into our program, that's what you're looking to do. This is going to be, you know, a, what you could do after your first motion class, which is really awesome. You'll learn how to create things in Illustrator, take your artwork from Illustrator and apply. Um, this is considered basic animation. So you'll learn all of this in your first motion class, which is really great. You know, uh, so if you don't mind me putting you two on the spot, um, a couple things I would tell you, I'm sure that there's a lot of students out there. So I try to, you know, I try to address some of these things, but I know for you students that are still hanging in, there's over 120 plus people still hanging out there. Um, I tend to find that a lot of students are, are kind of worried about taking the first step, you know, thinking I really like this is something that's interesting to me. It excites me, but can I really make a career out of this? Can I really make a living out of this? Uh, I don't know if either one of you two want to speak to that, but you know, maybe what it what was it in your journey that made you take that leap of faith to say, okay, this might not always be the traditional thing to do, but it's definitely something I'm passionate about that I can see myself doing professionally. That's such a great question, and it's something that you know we've all kind of have to kind of figure out that path along the way. My original major was computer science. Oops. Like, you know, it's a skill that I have continued to use, but I, that, like through that process, I realized that I'm also a creative person. And so because I'm interested in computers and because I'm in, like, you know, I, you know, I have coding skills and stuff, I've been able to go really far with it, but like figuring out that you're a creative person and somebody who can thrive in this area is a hard thing to do because your high school and stuff isn't set up for that. Like I did fine in high school, but you know, like I tried to make every project, like every assignment into like a puppet show or, <laughs> you know, something that was kind of creative um, because I didn't want to like be writing a paper. I didn't want to be doing those things. And so if you're a person who's like always trying to like, who likes making stuff um, and you know, like if you're not doing super great in school right now, but that you're a creative person and that like does this kind of stuff, you will love art school um, and you will love having a career as a designer uh, because even if you're not super shining in high school, um, that doesn't matter <laughs> in art school. It's great. Um, so I think once you can identify yourself as a creative person, you'll never, you rarely have to write papers. Like you'll be doing projects every time. I always lived for when there was a project that I was like, okay, I can be in charge of the PowerPoint thing, or I can do, you know, I can make a poster or, you know, like that part of the stuff was really fun for me. Um, and so if that seems like you at all, you would probably uh, really like it here. It's, it's scary at first because it's not something that's always kind of outlined in, in high school. But one of the things that's really great about coming to an art school is that like everybody else is that person too. So if you're the one, you know, kind of, weird creative kid i use the word weird because that was me um like you show up to art school and it's everybody is that way too and it's a really fun uh exciting uh place to be and i kind of feel like i've wandered off your original question i can't remember what it was now but that's kind of how my path kind of looked is i kind of had that realization that i was a creative person and that the kinds of stuff that i wanted to be doing is stuff that where i was making something and um, it took me a while to figure out where I belonged um, in that space. I, I knew, 
like to me being a you know an artist meant you had to draw really well and I already talked about before that that's something I was never really super confident in but I could make things and I paid attention to details and and um you know I liked making like little videos with my friends and I liked doing you know making anything and so um, I eventually kind of found my way into where you know the kind of the technology computers and stuff and the design kind of intertwined and that was um, I was at working in advertising, but I was doing kind of interactive stuff. So my kind of career kind of is where the advertising department and the web design and the media department meet. And that's why we're so closely tied together is because of that. Um, so it took me a while to figure out exactly where my skills were, were going to lie. But I think one of the real benefits about the academy is that there's a bunch of different majors, like every single creative thing is covered. So you'll find your spot here you'll find it <laughs> and you'll have lots of people to talk to, to consult with about it. So that was my long meandering answer for that. <laughs> no, it's a great answer because I think that I'm sure there's people on the thing right now that are like, I, I'm here cause I really like this. And I think this is something I want to pursue, but do I take a chance on myself? Is this, I mean, I think yeah. you know, taking a chance on this isn't quite maybe what it used to be. I think I've been doing this okay. for about 15 years and, the starving artist mentality used to be much stronger. And I think over time, culturally, people have been accepting that, hey, creative industries make a lot of money. There's a lot of things out there to do. And you can not just have a job, but really a career that you're passionate about. So another yeah, thing. That's a good point. Our industries are, you know, well-paid jobs. Um, you know, our graduates go and work at places like Google, <laughs> you know? So it's like, um, there's, and of course, a lot of different like, you know, startups and tech companies and ad agencies and that kind of stuff. But if you're looking for something that's like, you know, a solid job, um, like I would be really scared in some other areas of art and design, but I really like uh, kind of our areas because it's like, it's a job or you can, you know, own your own agency, that kind of thing, if that's something you're interested in, that it's, um, it's a, it's a, a really solid career. And so if you're, you know, parents are nervous about it and stuff like, like, it's pretty easy to, to find how, you know, uh, how successful you can be working in advertising or in the tech industry. Well, here's another question for you too. So I think that there's a few, I guarantee you, there's a bunch of students right here right now that are thinking, okay, like if I were going to start school, there's pretty much nowhere to go to school on site right now, uh, obviously for the foreseeable future, but you have been teaching courses online for 20 years now. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure if maybe you could speak to that, I guarantee you, and I know Nikki, this is your cup of tea as well, but any chance you could speak to how effective you can learn online, even if you intend to be on site in the future, how effective can you actually learn online? And what does that feedback component look like for students? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I have taught both on site and I've been teaching online for a really long time. Um, it's definitely not the same and it definitely takes um, initiative and planning. But I think that the level of teaching that we've been able to offer through online shows in our student work. Um, we like to engage with our students. We are constantly building new course content um, we, our courses are filled with lots of tutorials, um, not a lot of written, a lot of tutorials, a lot of things that you can follow along with. Um, and then, you know, you have an instructor who is either a full-time faculty or is currently working in the industry, um, with a lot of good feedback to give. A lot of our instructors like to give video feedback. So they'll be looking at your assignment and talking you through it and talking about how uh, you could improve. Um, there's a lot of that. It's not just, oh, this looks good. It's a lot of real, real feedback, you know, trying to make you a better designer, a better whatever it is you're looking to do. Um, so, and then also our small class sizes, you know, we have small classes, so it's really easy to engage with your fellow students. The instructors have time to give you good, thorough feedback. Um, and so I think all of that together uh, leads to high quality work coming out of our students and from our classes. Yeah, and I can kind of speak to how we're doing, um, you know, kind of our what we're calling virtual classes now, because that's what I've been doing in my classes. So, you know, what Nikki's describing is that there's, 
um, you know, stuff to read and there's videos and stuff and you kind of do it on your own time. But we also are doing virtual classes that are pretty much like this. They're in Zoom, except everyone's on camera all at the same time. Um, so you have to like, at least sort of do your hair to come to class. Um, but we have it at a scheduled time. Um, you know, just how we shared my screen here, that's how I share my screen for class as well. But I'll take questions and if students need help with something, I can take over their screen. So it works pretty well for our majors to do the virtual classes. Um, normally, if I was on campus, I would be showing my screen, but on a, like a, on a big TV or on a projector instead. Here it's on your own screen um, instead. So maybe you miss like, where I'm walking around to see you, but you can still share your screen with me. We can still, you can still ask me a question. Um, so you, I don't think for our departments, I think it works really, really well um, for it. We're really, um, you know, we've adapted really well to the virtual classes. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, it's a pretty easy transition to make. And if you liked this, then I think you'll like um, a virtual class as well. And I have another question for you too. Okay, so um, in your particular field, I've noticed that there's people that they, they learn the software, they study software, and they feel like, okay, I got the hang of this. So what do you think is the gap between somebody that is a professional designer versus someone that knows how to use the software? Oh my gosh, so many things. I mean, one of them is just the learning about design too, um, that the software is a tool. Um, and you can get a job just doing the tool, but somebody else will be being the creative person who's telling you what to do. That was my first job. <laughs> um, that was a way that I kind of got into the industry, but I was looking you know, over the wall at the people who were coming up with the ideas and I wanted to be that person. And being a creative person takes practice to be able to be creative on demand. And so I think that's one of the big things that you get out of school is practicing being creative on demand. That, you know, maybe right now when you're creative, it's when something comes to you, but as a professional, you have to like come up with a process where you can be creative regardless of who your client is, regardless of what the brief is, like you have to be ready to go. And so that's something that you practice in school and it takes practice. Uh, but the other thing, a big component, I think that those people are missing is feedback mm -hmm. um, that you'll never really improve unless you're constantly getting a critique and you're constantly getting feedback. And that's something we still even do as professionals is we're still constantly getting feedback from each other, but there's nothing that can replace that if you're just learning the software, you absolutely have to like be constantly putting your work in front of other people and talking about it. That's great. That's a great answer because I've always, you know, thought that the that the gap is really when a designer has a theory and they can explain and articulate. Because I think a lot of times that people underestimate in these types of fields is that you're always you're also growing a people skill to work with clients and learn how to work with clients. It's not always just, this is my creative idea. Like if the client doesn't like the logo, you're back to the drawing board to make, you know, your creative ideas meet their needs. And I always thought that that's such a huge part of what we teach too, is how to take that feedback and implement it. Yeah, that's such a big part of things. And like, you know, what we do in our fields is communicate with people. Um, and sometimes that's communicating with a client. Sometimes it's, you know, through our design, am I communicating how fun this gelato place is to the person who's viewing it? And so I can have an idea of, and be a hundred percent sure that this idea is being communicated to people. But if people, if I show it to somebody and they don't get it, mm -hmm. then that's a skill that we have to practice. Um, if you're interested in working with like practicing on clients, uh, we've got a really cool class. Um, it's a really good opportunity. Um, and it's open to most majors, pretty much any major I think can take it, but it's definitely something that's a big part of the advertising program, big part of the web design and new media program. This is a little um, kind of creative lab, we like to call it. It's called Young and Hungry. Um, Young and Hungry is kind of like its own little kind of um, our own school, student-driven, like, ad agency slash creative 
uh, house like slash design studio. So ma no matter what major you are, you can come and contri contribute to that. And what that does is, you know, you are going to be working with a client uh, a lot of the time. The client will come and say, here's what I want. And they sometimes don't really know what they want because they're not designers. They don't know how to, to speak in that language. And so that's where our communication skills and that practice comes into play about, well, I kind of can see what your needs are as a client. Um, here's what we recommend to you and kind of explaining to them why this idea is going to work or why this is what we recommend to them. And so that's something that can serve as kind of like an internship. It can kind of be kind of some work experience. Our people who take that put it on their resume as like an internship as work experience because it is. Um, and so that's a really great opportunity to have something to do while you're in school of even like being able to practice working in teams, working with a client, doing presentations. It's something that I recommend for everybody who works in the design field. Yeah, and the feedback I've received from anybody that participates in that is that it's, yeah. it's great for your portfolio, it's great for your networking. Yeah, and, and once it's back, once we're back, you know, on campus, it's like Young and Hungry's got its own like special spot. It doesn't feel like a classroom at all. It feels like a little agency. It's got like a fridge in there that's always got Red Bull in it. There's a coffee maker. There's, you know, it's like, it's a pretty kind of fun spot to be and to kind of hang out and uh, collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, hey, so uh, students, before we wrap this up, is there, are there any other questions at all for, um, for Andrea, for Nikki, or anything that we can address for you tonight? I know that tonight was really just to focus on a sample of something you can do, but are there any other questions about the career, any questions about the school, anything that we can answer for you from them before we wrap it up tonight? I know there was a lot of questions that blew by that were kind of specifics about what we were doing. Um, like if you come and, and start to take classes, you know, you'll get every single detail you need in order to move forward. So um, hopefully this is enough to get you excited about it uh, to move forward. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, putting this together for you guys tonight. Perfect. Uh, yeah, well, hey, uh, there's some questions out there that I'll address, but the first thing I'm gonna do is this. So, so folks, if you're out there, the way this process works is that we have an admissions team and what their job is, is to try to help you one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're, if you're thinking about, hey, do I wanna join this school or even just do I wanna learn more about it? Um, the way that this process goes is we actually just set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you and your family or whoever you'd like to have involved. And it's really just a conversation. It's just to talk about your interests, what your goals are, if you've been to school, if you've not been to school, uh, our job is to try to get to know you, and then we'll try to help you by making recommendations that make the most sense. If you do not have a portfolio, you can still go to the school. We teach students from scratch. Sometimes it's almost easier to teach a student from scratch in some ways. But if you have work, if you have examples, if you've taken courses, we're more than happy to look at your portfolio work, anything that you've done in the past, and we'll try to help you to figure out, will any of those units transfer into our school? Or even if you have no units, but you just have some skill set, we're always happy to try to figure out what courses we can waive for you so that you can start in courses that make the most sense for your for whatever level you're beginning at. Uh, we do teach master's programs and we teach undergraduate programs and we even have what's called a pre-college program. So if there's any students out there really quickly that are in high school right now, if you're in high school, you haven't graduated yet, your class of 2021, 2022, so on and so forth, we have a pre-college art experience program. I'm gonna go ahead and put the link in there, but I would tell you that's a free program where you can take courses. Uh, this next semester for fall will be all online, but feel free to go ahead and click on that link. It's a free application. You can check out the classes. Someone will reach out to you. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the link in of how to apply to the university. Now, if you're ready to apply to the university, go ahead and do an application. If you feel like you'd rather have a one-on-one -on -one and talk through it a little bit before you do an application, like I said, just send me an email. My goal will be to get back to you as quickly as I can and also schedule that time to talk one-on-one -on -one this way that we can figure out how we can help you. So uh, this is just been my last bit of advice before we sign off is that I would tell you, I, I've been doing this for a really long time and I've been lucky enough to travel the country, see different schools, see different levels of work. I would say not only just because I work here, but the Academy of Art puts out 
some of the best products uh, you can find anywhere you go. And that meaning that our students are ready to work. The portfolio levels that come out of our university are amazing. Uh, and what I'd like to just kind of leave everybody off with is that I, I tend to find that the difference between the students that really do well in their careers and the ones that maybe are in the middle or at the bottom, it's really more effort based. So if you find yourself in a position where you're like, I really am passionate about this. I can do this every day. This is something I geek out on on my own time anyway. I would tell you, you're probably in the right place at a school that will help you, that will push you, that will guide you. Uh, by no means is this a weeding out school, but I would tell you that the school is going to challenge you because what we want to do is balance that creative freedom, but also teach you the concepts and skill sets that you're going to need to become a professional in that field. So if you find yourself in a home here where you're like, I really like this place, I like San Francisco, or I like the way your online works, uh, please make sure you reach out to me. My, my team and I will be more than happy to work with each and every one of you one-on-one. -on -one. So as we're wrapping up, uh, if you guys don't mind, if you can, just for self-esteem purposes for all of us, uh, make sure if you want to say a big thank you to the team here. First of all, thank you to Andrea. Thank you to Nikki for putting this on tonight and taking your evening to, uh, to host. I think that this has been a big hit and it was super cool to see what you're working on. So students, if you want to send them a big thank you in the chat. Uh, some people behind the scenes that you probably don't know about. Big shout out to Wakana for helping us out. Mr. John Beeson for putting the arrangements together. William and marketing for knocking this out. Uh, Judy's out there. I know that we have uh, people helping us with YouTube behind the scenes. And last but not least, uh, Kathleen. She lives and dies on Zoom with us every single evening. So thank you once again, as always, Kathleen, for putting this on. Um, and that would pretty much be my last piece. So I hope all of you are safe out there. I hope that things are going well for you. If you'd like to take the time to connect tonight, send me an email. Or if you just uh, belated, Steve, you remember my birthday. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, if, uh, if I can hang back uh, and answer any questions, I'll be more than happy to. Uh, but the last thing I'm going to do is drop my email in one more time. So please don't be shy to reach out to me. And I'll be here tonight to try to facilitate some of your questions and more importantly, set up those one-on-ones for everybody. So uh, thank you all. It's been a great night. Be safe and we'll see you soon. Bye guys. Thank you.